Wisconsin Eye's 2014 election coverage is brought to you by the Wisconsin Hospital Association. For over 90 years, a valued voice for Wisconsin hospitals, supporting high-quality, high-value care in communities like yours. Wisconsin I is at the Nita Public Library interviewing candidates in the 2014 election. Those of you that watch Wisconsin I realize we normally do these one on one, but Wisconsin I is very grateful that the two candidates for the 57th Assembly District have agreed to do a joint forum. So I'd like you to meet Amanda Stuck of Appleton, and she's the Democratic candidate, and Chris Klein of Menasha is the Republican candidate. And Wisconsin I appreciates the support of the Wisconsin Hospital Association, which represents 139 hospitals and health systems for making these candidate interviews possible. Um, Amanda and Chris, again, thanks for doing a joint forum. Um, uh, opening statements, I think, Chris, do you want to go first? Sure, sure. Um, well, I'm Chris Klein. I'm running for the 57th Assembly District. I um, live in Menasha. I grew up in Brown Deer. I uh, went to UW Oshkosh. I have a small business in Menasha, a real estate and insurance company. I have um, been an alderman in the city of Menasha. I've uh, been involved in my community for over 20 years. I've been on boards and committees with the, within the city and volunteering and co youth, uh, coaching youth sports. Uh, I have two kids. I have two grandkids. Um, I, I, I'm running for this because I want to make Wisconsin one of the best places to live, work, and retire. Uh, I want to make sure that we're um, have affordable health care, that we're creating jobs, and that we have a strong economy. Um, I, I've been elected before, so I think I have the experience and leadership to be an independent voice and a, and a leader uh, for the uh, residents of the 57th district. Just a quick follow-up. You were elected to what? Uh, the City local government? Alderman. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. okay. Amanda, City of Manasha Alderman. City yep. of Manasha Alderman. Correct. Thank you. Excuse me, Amanda. Sure. Well, I'm Amanda Stuck. I was born and raised in Appleton. I also attended UW Oshkosh, where I graduated with a master's degree in public administration. I currently work for the Appleton Housing Authority, where I work with low-income families on a rental assistance program. Uh, my husband and I have stayed in the community here raising our family. Uh, my husband's a sheet metal journeyman, and my family is one of the big reasons why I'm running. I do want to make sure that our kids get the best education, that they have the ability to get living wage jobs when they do graduate. My husband's a sheet metal journeyman, as I said, and we know work has been tough in the state. He's really had to travel outside the state a lot to get work, and I'm running just to make sure there is a voice for working families like ours down in Madison. Okay, I'm going to throw out some major issues that will be part of the next state budget and uh, the next session, yeah, so if you could both react to that. The first one I want to start with, I'm finding that how we continue to fund public schools is one of the biggest issues. So if you're, if you're in the assembly, Assembly, what's important to you as we begin to have the next dialogue over how to pay for public schools? Would you like to start, Amanda? Sure. Um, this is something I actually spent some time on in my master's program at UW Oshkosh. I'm doing a study on what actually works to grow your economy. And the number one investment you can make is in education. So it's vitally important that we do invest in our schools properly. Um, I would definitely support changing the funding to our schools to um, the proposal that Tony Evers had put forward uh, with the fair funding for our future. We need to make sure we are funding our schools fully, um, but also be careful about property taxes on people, I'm sorry, on people, and that plan does cover both, both of those, making sure schools have their full funding, the two-thirds funding, while holding the line on property taxes. I forgot, does uh, Tony Evers' plan, w w would it raise the sales tax and offset the property tax, Amanda? Um, well, I, I won't propose to know all the details okay. of you know, exactly um, every aspect of it, but it does have in there a proposal to change the 30% to have a poverty factor in there, That's right. so the property taxes are based on ability to pay, not just on the value of the home. Okay. Chris, thanks for your patience. Sure. Uh, well, 
you know, I agree with the, you know, education is primary to the economic success in the state and having a well-educated workforce is, is, uh, um, is, is important for a, a strong economy. Funding for public education, it, a reasonable approach, responsible approach to funding public education, I support. Um, our teachers, our administrators, uh, we need to be providing the, the resources that are necessary for them. Um, we, there are a number of funding options for schools, and we've seen it in the, in the Fox Valley, especially in Appleton and Menasha recently with referendums. Um, there was $30 million referendum in, in Menasha that passed, $25 million referendum in Appleton that passed, another $5 million reoccurring referendum in Appleton that just recently passed. There are, there's also the funding for um, energy efficiency projects for schools that won't doesn't go against a tax levy. School boards can levy that themselves. Menasha did a $10 million um, uh, borrowing on that, and Appleton over $600,000. Um, so there, there are other options plus granting. And uh, so there's, there's a lot of funding options for public school right now. Uh, we do need to continue to fund our public schools until we come up with a better business model. Other than that, I think it's important that, because there are kids and families who still want to stay in their neighborhoods, go to the schools that they're comfortable with, that they can walk to, and we, need, we do need to continue to fund our public schools. Another big issue as yes. we talk about funding schools next year is the school choice and school voucher issue. Mm -hmm. Now, it had been in these two urban cities, uh, city of Racine and Milwaukee expanded statewide with an enrollment cap of 1,000. If you're in the assembly, what would you, well, first of all, uh, choice and voucher schools, and do you think they should be expanded? Speaker Voss has said the 1,000 cap out state should come off. Your feelings, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, I, I do believe that parents should have uh, the opportunity for choice in education. Um, the 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 choice program did start in Milwaukee, and it was is to really to get kids out of out of uh, underperforming schools, and parents have a choice of sending them someplace else. As a matter of fact, my dad was the uh, one of the principals of the 220 program in, at Brown Deer High School back in the 70s and 80s, where the busing program started, and um, there was an opportunity for parents to have their kids bus to the suburbs from the inner cities, primarily minority kids. I think we, I think states are a great place for education innovation, including education funding. I still have some questions that I'd love to work with the other legislators on and on, on moving forward with uh, continue to use voucher programs, but let's see how it works. But ultimately it's about educating our kids and, and creating a well-educated workforce for um, the state so economically we're moving forward. Quick follow-up, yeah. do you want to see the 1,000 cap on out-state choice students lifted in the next budget, sir? Well, those are some of the questions I still have. Okay. I mean, there's still some, still some questions I need to, I haven't had been able to get answered that where I could fundamentally say yes or no to that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Amanda? Um, I do not think we should expand the voucher program at all and actually I would like to take it back um, from where it was expanded. The tax cut that went along with that voucher expansion will cost us $60 million in each budget. Um, we did spend $124 million in expanding that program while we, at the same time cutting, you know, the Republicans had cut $1.6 billion out of the public school system and never put any of that back in there. So I don't think it's the best use of taxpayer dollars. I think it's creating two different school systems that ultimately, um, you know, we can't fund that. It's not responsible, and it will only hurt our students in the long run. Just to clarify, do you want to keep it going in re in the city of Racine and M Milwaukee? Um, I think those are things I would like to talk about with the representatives from that area who knew better how it is working there and what effect it's having. Okay. Um, recently, Governor Walker, as you know, asked that the legislature withdraw or re re repeal from Common Core standards. Your feeling on that, Amanda? I think it's your turn. Sure. Um, I would not vote to repeal Common Core standards. We do need some standards in order to make our students competitive globally. And, you know, the idea is really that students in Tennessee in second grade are learning some common things that students in Wisconsin in second grade are learning so that across the nation our students have some standards but the local school districts do have the control, did have the input on, on those standards. So I think it is a good system that works but yet 
does set some standards for our students to measure um, that we are teaching them what they need to learn to be competitive. Thank you. And Chris? Well, as a son of retired school teachers, I've seen the profound difference good teachers can make. I think that um, uh, with I think local control is very important in this in this case. That our teachers, our, our superintendents, our, our parents have the the final say in, in what happens with their curriculum. As a matter of fact, in Wisconsin, by statute, we have the right to every district get, has the right to come up with their own curriculum if they wish. Um, I've, I've met with the the superintendents of Appleton and Menasha. We we I've gone over the curriculums with them, um, and. and they don't have a problem with a change, but they want to know what we want to do. And I think I'm the same way. Let's, let's see what, what changes we, we're going to make. And if we're going to do that, if we're going to make changes, let's include the universities, the colleges, the tech schools. Let's collaborate with education as lawmakers and come up with a better solution if we have one. Let's, in, let's build in our business and industry. Let's find out what, because eventually all these people that were education are going to be out into the workforce. Let's find out what business and industry needs from our education system. Because again, ultimately, our goal is to educate our kids and so that we have a, a well-educated workforce for the greater success of this state. Okay. Um, new subject, transportation funding. Mm -hmm. The Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance says that's one of the biggest uh, difficult issues in the next biennial budget. If, and I'm quoting the Taxpayers Alliance, if we continue funding transportation at the 2013 level, we have a $2 billion deficit in 10 years. That's their number. If we have a deficit, how would we fill it? And Chris, I think it's your turn. Sure. Well, we, I believe there's a, a, a constitutional amendment that's coming up in the ballot this year that would it protect is. that budget, and I support that. I think that when the money goes into that, that fund, it needs to stay in that fund. I think this is a this is a, a multi-prong approach. This has to be compre comprehensive how we at attack this. The gas tax is an effective source of revenue right now. We haven't adjusted it for inflation since 2006. Uh, Fifty percent of that uh, our budget is from the gas tax. Thirty percent from registration and fees. Our federal mandates on on fuel efficiencies. Our fewer drivers, uh, miles driven, all have affected us filling that fund through that. So I think it's going to take a, 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 a comprehensive approach to this. Nobody wants to talk about increasing anything, taxes or fees, uh, but I think it's important that we maintain a, a, uh, an infrastructure in the state of Wisconsin because our businesses need that to be competitive because we're competing against other states for our businesses and to have a well-maintained infrastructure is important for uh, our our state's uh, economic feasibility. Would you consider raising either the gas tax or the $75 that you and I pay to register our vehicles, Chris? Well, we pay above average already uh, in the country. We're about 30% higher than every, every place else. Um, we, uh, we're about 14th highest of, of the states. So we're already paying well above average. So I don't know if we can afford to, to be more aggressive with uh, our revenue. We may have to look at other ways to cut I mean, we have a big project going on right in our district, the, the Highway 10-114 project, which is vital to ex economic expansion in this area. And that's been 20 or 30 years in the, in the waiting for that to, to happen. So it's taken that long to wait for that project to even get to the point where we are now, and it's still going to take three or four years for that to get done. So to increase costs, I, I, as a fiscal conservative, I would, I would say let's try to find a way to manage our costs before we start increasing them. And just a footnote, the zoo freeway in, in, in Milwaukee, $1.7 billion. Amanda, Correct. thanks for your patience. You're, yes. Uh, yeah, so we definitely we have to fix it. I mean, if we don't start coming up with some real answers to this, we're going to be in big trouble with our transportation fund. I do agree we need to have it segregated so we stop taking money out for other things from that fund, and that we know that any taxes that go into the fund are strictly used for transportation costs. Um, as far as options to fill it, I mean, it's... it's difficult. You know, we are in a place where, you know, we don't have lots of extra money. So we do have to figure out how we are going to come up with money to fill that. I think we need to look at all options, but all options need to be evaluated based on what would be best for the people yet meet our needs. Same question I asked Chris. Would you consider raising gas tax or the $75 registration fee? Yeah, I mean, before I would commit to any one answer, I think we need more information on the impact of all the different options so we can choose the best one or possibly a mix 
of all the different options. Okay, question on health care. Um, as you know, one in five Wisconsin residents gets their health care through the Medicaid program. The American Hospital Association says our Medicaid reimbursements are second lowest in the nation. If you've studied the issue, do you think the next budget is the one to raise those reimbursements? Amanda, I think it's your turn. Um, well, you know, I actually have dealt with this issue personally. When I was a single mother in college, I was on the Medicaid program, and I remember calling around to dentists when my son had a toothache, and nobody would take us because we were on Medicaid. And of course, a big part of that is that when they're not getting the reimbursement rates to at least cut, you know, break even from providing those services, they aren't going to offer them to people. Um, so it's really important that we do raise the rates. However, again, it comes down to where do we get the money to do that. Um, so it's definitely something we need to look at doing, but it would, again, means some tough choices to get there. Good. Yeah, you know, the um, ACA has made some big changes on, on Medicaid and Medicare reimbursements, and I think that's, that affected it. Either they, I think they moved it even from January to, to, to June or, or April. Um, it's kind of fluid with how things are operating there, but uh, it's been a challenge, and it's going to continue to be a challenge until you know we settle on what how Obamacare is really going to function, you know, with accepting Medicaid or not accepting Medicaid and and moving people on or off in certain poverty levels. Uh, it's been a challenge for everybody, and I, I, until you know the federal government has made some changes to, to Medicare, they've they've allowed reimbursements to increase, but not to Medicaid. And that's really, I think, a, a, a matter for, for our Congress to address first before we can address it at the state level. A follow-up <clears throat> follow question. Was it wise of Governor Walker and the leaders of the Senate and Assembly to tell the federal government, thanks, but no thanks, we're not going to take your money to expand MA? Chris, you want to? Sure. Well, I, again, I think it was difficult for everybody with, with uh, ACA. And um, I think the decisions that were made were made for the long, for the long term. Uh, health care program in the state of Wisconsin. Um, what, what I think that the governor and the legislature did was a reasonable compromise that we had in Wisconsin. What, what, uh, what my concern was, or my concern is, is that if we were to take the Medicare, our Medicaid expansion, we're moving more folks into that uh, Medicaid role three, four years down the line, the federal government says, wait a second, we don't have the money for you anymore. Now we've placed all those people into the state Medicaid role, and now the risk falls back onto the taxpayer. I think it, what's, what's been a reasonable compromise is that anybody below the poverty level has access to Medicaid, to Badger Care. Above that, where we can uh, transfer them into the marketplace. They can find subsidies through ACA. We've, uh, you know, more people are being covered for health insurance and getting health care while still respecting the taxpayers along the way. So I think it was a reasonable compromise. How about you, Amanda, on that decision? I would disagree with that. I don't think it was a wise choice. I think, first of all, that's our tax money we pay to the federal government, that we should absolutely be getting it back here. Uh, because we didn't take the money, it also costs us more to cover less people. And so I, I would disagree with that decision. Okay, two questions on in environmental issues. Um, one of the first bills that to pass the last session was the one that allowed Go, Gibi, Tack, and I to apply for the permit to potentially open an open pit iron mine in Ashland and Iron County. Do you know, have you followed the bill, uh, that change enough to know whether you would have voted for it? Amanda, I think it's your turn. Yeah, I would not have voted for that. Um, you know, again, having husband as a sheet metal worker, I do know that it can be tough when it comes down to choosing between something that might create jobs here and the environmental impacts that it may have. Um, that bill, as it was written, you know, only had negative sides. There are ways we can move forward with mining that still protects the environment. There were uh, proposals like the Cullen Schultz bill that did include input from environmental groups. It provided for some local control so that the local people did have some say in what happened there. And we need to move more in that direction versus um, taking away the local control and proceeding with mining with no oversight or input from other groups. Thank you. Chris, would you have voted for it? I would have voted for it. I, I think uh, um, some of the factors there, the environmental issues were, I think, um, completely covered. 
and the EPA is involved, the DNR is involved, the Sierra Club is involved, the local control is involved, the, the uh, Gigobic is, is going way out of their way in order to uh, you know, cover all these bases, especially the environmental issues. As an, as an avid outdoorsman, I support protecting our waterways, our forests, but there's also uh, the, the job aspect of this. It would have created high paying jobs for especially for that region and even for the guys in the trades and you know uh, you know I met with the, the uh, um, trade group business uh, building trade group here and they were talking about that same thing that pipe fitters and, and welders and sheet metal workers um, all these guys are interested in those jobs and that would have created um, some those truly family supporting wage jobs and one other issue that's being debated is our growing frac sand mining industry. There's, there was a bill introduced, drafted, it was never voted on, that would have set state basic standards, no local government could go beyond that. The other side is local government should be the ones to determine uh, the rules and regulations for frac sand mining. Which side are you on? Chris, it's your sure. turn. Yeah, and, and that's one of those bigger issues that I think we can, we can make a, st a statewide standard. Where, where the permitting is at one place, the permitting happens you know, in a, a less burdensome time, the, the, all the regulations are handled in, a, in a one spot at one time. That, so we're, we're continuing to move our economy, we're, we're, we're filling a void in, in, um, in our economy right now that's just, um, frac sand is one of the uh, most desirable products in the oil industry right now. And from a from a, a permitting standpoint, I think that is one um, situation where I think we can use a, 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 at the state level. Aside from that, I'm, I'm a local control person. As, a, as an alderman, I believed in local control and crabbed about the, the state always sending down you know, memorandums to us to how we're supposed to operate, which I disagreed with. Thank you. Amanda? Um, I definitely believe in local control over some parts of mining, and um, I think it's hard to say it should be all one or the other. I think it all depends on exactly what the proposal is and the wording of each bill that you have to really look at before you decide. Um, but in general, I do favor there being local control over many aspects of it. Okay. There was a bill last session, there'll be a bill next session to legalize the medical use of marijuana. Traveling with that, of course, is the Colorado and state of Washington where they have legalized the recreational. Uh, your positions on that issue? I forgot whose turn it is. I think it's yours. Okay. Um, well, I do support you know marijuana use for medicinal purposes. I do think um, that that's important. That some people it does work for them, and if the doctor says that's the best thing, that's they should be able to use that. Uh, as far as recreationally, you know, I would probably need some more information to make a determination on that. Um, you know, I don't think we should be locking people up for nonviolent offenses. You know, for things like that, but we do need probably to be careful and just make sure we're making the best decision as how we move forward with recreational use. Thank you. Chris? Well, I oppose uh, any, any further expansion of use of marijuana. Um, I, I don't think it, we have a, we need another source for uh, addiction or um, our kids have access to any other type of drugs. We have enough already that are, we have to fight with our kids to, to keep away from them. We're already seeing things coming out of Washington and, and Colorado that are, are, are becoming a, a little unsettling. Uh, the high driving, the parents who um, are, you know, mothers who are nursing their kids uh, that are using marijuana, uh, the incidence of, of small children that are being Im admitted to emergency rooms because of uh, marijuana overdoses. And, and, and uh, uh, so I think that, you know, seeing what, what's happening right now with, with uh, heroin in, in this area, that I don't think we need to introduce any other drugs in, into our society. And um, so I would, I would certainly not support uh, any further expansion of marijuana use. Okay. It was an issue in the Democratic primary for Attorney General, so I'm going to ask it. First offense, drunken driving, should it be a crime? I think it's your turn. Sure. Uh, no, I don't think it should be a crime. I think that uh, we have some pretty stiff penalties already. Um, we have, uh, you know, there's uh, high um, um, fines, there's uh, you know, loss of license, there's uh, um, interlock, uh, ignition interlock, there's uh, um, escalators for drug or breath or 
blood alcohol and minors in the vehicle. By the time you get to the fourth, you're really looking at a felony and a habitual user by then. So you're probably looking at prison time. I don't think we're, you know, uh, we need to be locking people up or putting them through the, the uh, judicial system to clog up the courts with that. They can be handled at the municipal court level and, and they can have fines. Interdiction, intervention, um, both Winnebago County and Outagamie County both have strong interdiction and intervention programs. As a matter of fact, Outagamie County just came out with a unique, unique uh, technology where they can put a bracelet on you as a drunk driver and monitor your, your alcohol through your skin uh, remotely so that you, if you are using, you know, what the, what the trick was that they test you and then you can go out drinking, but now you can't. So um, I think that, um, you know, and, and also the, the Tavern League has really taken a strong stance on education and uh, the safe driver program that uh, has kept thousands of drunk drivers off the road and uh, I think it's uh, effective. Thank you. Amanda? This is a really tough issue. I was out actually knocking on doors when I ran into a mother at one of the doors I was at whose son had been killed by a drunk driver. So this was an issue near and dear to her heart and she was obviously heartbroken by this happening. It was an awful thing. Um, so it's something we have to keep in mind that that is the end result that can happen from drunk driving and it's a serious thing. At the same time, we have to balance that with what first time felon it means to get a job then, hard to get housing. Um, you know, I do think we really need to look at what really will address the heart of the issue. So treatment programs, you know, in Outagamie County where we have things like the drug courts that can really help people get the treatment and things they need to really address the issue rather than just locking people up, which doesn't necessarily really address the issue. Okay. Um, both of you cite the need for jobs. So here's my question. What hasn't been tried to create or protect jobs in Wisconsin? Any new ideas of what should be tried or things you might be interested in working on if you were in the assembly? I think it's your turn, Amanda. Okay. Well, you know, I know in the last session, um, the Democrats had put forward like something like 22 jobs bills that never went anywhere. So they included things like uh, Buy American, Buy Wisconsin, um, more funding for the tech schools, which is really important because in order to bring jobs here, we need to have the workers that are educated in the jobs employers have. Um, so those are really important things. I think we also need to make the WEDC more transparent and a public agency again so that they are accountable so we know what they're doing with tax dollars to bring jobs here and create jobs here. Okay. So those are some big things. Thank you. On, on your website, Chris, you mm -hmm. talk about, um, let's see, uh, limited government, lower taxes, and pro-growth. So yeah. what's, wh what's your feeling on uh, jobs? Sure. Well, well certainly it, from a taxation standpoint, even though some of the reforms that we've already made in, in Wisconsin, we're still one of the highest tax states in, in the union. Um, continuing to uh, streamline our tax code is important. I think that um, encouraging uh, small businesses, nurturing entrepreneurs, um, supporting the businesses that are creating the jobs, that support people in the 57th district with these with high paying wage jobs. Uh, redevelopment, I think, is another big aspect, especially in, in, the, in our district. The, we have, a, we have a, a very urban, older district with a lot of industrial, old industrial paper mills, industrial sites that are now being torn down and, and redeveloped. The state can get involved with, with the brownfield sites and, and help to redevelop those and create jobs uh, and, and tax base and, and economic base for some of these old uh, parts of, the, uh, of our communities. Okay. Thank you. I hope I've covered most of the issues. If I haven't, it's time to jump in. If not, go well, ahead. I would just maybe add one. Um, Please. You know, just Penny Bernard Shaver, who currently holds the seat, who's leaving, one big thing she has worked on is the RTA, um, Regional Transit Authority. And I do think that's a really important issue in our district. I know the Fox Valley um, stands to lose a lot of money in their transportation funding, and they would really have to cut back on services, which means less transportation for people to work in school. Um, so I think it's a big issue for our area. Yeah, uh, any PS on that, Chris? Well, I, have, I haven't heard of any funding cuts yet. Um, they've, they've talked about funding cuts, but I haven't heard of any yet. They, they've threatened to cut funding for uh, under a certain population level, but uh, the federal government still haven't ruled on or done anything on that. So I think it's a, a little premature to start um, taxing the, the, the citizens until we're sure that okay. something's truly going to happen. Um, but then, and then we'll get into a discussion on the RTA. Okay, thanks for adding that issue. Sure. Uh, closing statements, I think, Amanda, your turn. 
I would just look forward to representing District 57 as a working family. We know we need a voice down there. Uh, many of the policies that have been put forward down there recently really only benefit the top 1% and they really are just increasing our deficit. So we need somebody down there who really is going to work on getting rid of that deficit while making working families a priority in doing that. Thank you. Chris? Well, I look forward to uh, representing the, the people of 57th District. I've, I've been elected before, so I know the type of uh, responsibilities that we we uh, need to make and the type of decisions that we need to make. Um, I, I can be an independent representative for all the people in the district and um, I look forward to it and um, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Thank you. Wisconsin I wants to thank the two candidates on November 4 in the 57th Assembly District, Amanda Stuck of Appleton, the Democrat, Chris Klein of Menasha, the Republican. Thanks so much for talking to You're Wisconsin welcome. Thank I. You. Thank you. Thank you.